back, Crusaders. This is the Nerd Crusade Podcast, episode 46. I'm your host, Ian, and with me as always is Courtney. Hello. This week we're going to be talking about uh, Monarch, as uh, latest episode, the Doctor Who Special 3, uh, Candy Cane Lay, the new Eddie Murphy movie on Prime, um, and uh, some uh, announcements from the Video Game Awards and the winners and whatnot. Uh, so, uh, we'll jump right into it with uh, Monarch. This episode was called uh, The Way Out. Yep. Because um, basically it was a little bit about uh, the... The daughter, the daughter going through her trauma of like the way out is through, because basically, they basically kind of redo the first up epi- the first episode where like instead of it being uh, her in Japan finding out finding the secret family, it's uh, Kintaro it- seeing it from seeing the same thing but from his side and the mother's reaction and like going to the office and. Seeing like, oh yeah, see, this doesn't feel too nice when you're being a dick about it. And mm-hmm. yeah, it's actually true that your dad had two, two separate lives. Yeah. Um. So basically, you get to see like the aftermath of of what happened in San Francisco. And basically, San Francisco has been abandoned because I would have originally thought like radiation, maybe from like the atomic breath. Yeah. Because like they absorb radiation, but Godzilla did like blow them Do. away with the atomic breath, right? So you'd think there'd be radiation everywhere. But no, it's a year later and it's, the, it's still... It's the foundations though. Yeah. Which, yeah, it makes sense because of all of the destruction and the, the Maruto's like burrowing down burrowing. in the China yeah. district. Yeah. Yeah. So it, they kind of explain by like they're going, as they sneak into... Old San Francisco get to the dad's office there to see if there's any clues there. Um, they mentioned, oh yeah, the building may look like it's stable, but because of all the fighting that was happening, the foundations were were offset, so yeah. it'll just fall over randomly. Which makes sense from, like you said, the Muto digging, Godzilla tromping through it. So, like, originally we thought, like, okay, they would have just cleaned up and rebuilt. Yeah, but... but it's only been a year, and it would it take some time. It does take time, because you have to go through permits and getting the right contractors and then going through and make sure you have all the evidence of Godzilla and the Marutos and cleaning all that up so you don't get scavengers and uh, other yeah, people it, just grabbing random stuff. What turns out is that like her mother has a company where... Well, her mother works for FEMA. Hmm. For FEMA. Who goes... Who uh, has a... con. Uh, not a contract, but a pass from the government that allows her and her team to go into the uh, restricted, zones. restricted zones to collect items for people. Yeah, but basically, she said like people are looking for like their photo albums and like memories and memories and stuff like that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, she works for FEMA, but she basically is going in and finding people's memories, keep, memories and keepsakes to bring back and then give back to them. Um, that's kind of like what her business is now. Um, but she's been so focused on that, that she's kind of avoided the whole, where's my husband thing at. Yep. Which sounded like she's been avoiding for the past 30 years of their marriage. Yeah. Cause when like she meets Kintaro, like she l- takes a look at him and it's very clear that, oh, she suspected something. Yeah. And this was the proof. And she's like, shit, yeah. I was right. And it comes <laughs> out that basically she wanted to know, but was too scared to find out for herself. And basically pushed her daughter to do so because what we don't know is that after the daughter um, lost the, the school bus full of children and whatnot after G Day, <laughs> she basically went into a depression, a depression funk and like sat in her room and did nothing the whole time. Yeah, so, which you kind of understand watching a school bus full of kids that you were in charge of just fall into the water and they die. Yeah, and they, and also you discover she had a girlfriend who died. In the in basically the yeah. shelter, yeah. She said because she was a school teacher and she was had she had a girlfriend at the school that she uh, that she was going to move in with or wanted her to move in. And what I don't know if it was real or not is because they asked, the other t- uh, the principal like said, "Hey, I can go with the school bus. You can stay here with her." Mm-hmm. And then she said, "No, I'll go with the bus instead." And then the girlfriend came back and said, "No, you know I didn't learn my lesson, knowing that she didn't want to like move, really move in with her." Yeah. I don't know if that was imagined, that, con- that short conversation there was imagined, or if that really happened. But yeah, like basically, that was a little fuzzy. Yeah, they basically said, though, at the school, because she said, like, hey, it's okay, I'm going to stay here, make sure everybody gets out of school. We'll go to one of the underground shelters if we need to. Mm-hmm. 
and that's why that's where we assume she died. So that's why when she was in Tokyo and she was in an underground shelter in the subway, she's like, "No, this isn't safe. I need to get out of here because like, yep, you're, you're freaking not, out. You're not going to be protected in a subway." Um, Which fair, <laughs> yeah. Uh, considering, and she also has a, another panic attack while they're in a subway. Yeah, too. because they have to. The uh, government's in the exclusion zone or in San Francisco, and if, if they find any looters, they shoot them on site, basically. Yep. They'll either round them up or most likely yeah. shoot them. Because they could get in with the mom's company, but where they were going was completely restricted, where they, nobody was allowed to be. Mm-hmm. So, they, And they had to be back by 8. Yeah, they get dropped off at night, and they have to be back by 8 a.m. to get back out. Um, so they're running around. They're getting chased by a little bit of the government. Because when they're being stupid, being loud about shit, then goofing off. Yeah, it's, it's like, like, dude, you're in, you're in a restricted zone. Shut the they're fuck like up. in their twenties, so you'd think like you would have a little bit of adult common sense, right? Yeah. So as they're goofing off, sharing memories of of their dad's idiocracies or whatnot, um, they get loud. The government shows up. They start getting chased by them. Luckily, they're kind of run into other uh, refugees or looters there who end up running off and taking them off the scent. But they have to kind of crawl through a collapsed tunnel, and that's where she freaks out. And that's where the title of the episode comes from, where May is basically telling her, hey, um, the way out is through. So she has to get over her trauma by going through this tunnel and getting out, which Kintaro finds a way out for yep. them. They get there. But this also <clears throat> this also shows how much like May is still not a likable character. Because She's a total cunt. She goes and she calls Monarch and tells him, yeah, we're going to the dad's office. Yeah. What She's, do I need to do so I can just go home and get out of all this shit? Yeah, it's like you're such an asshole. You could you could fucking walk away. Give them the, they say give us the files and we'll walk and you can walk away or whatnot. Um, and you refuse to do so, but now you're like, okay, I want to play games with Monarch. Yeah, so she's basically uh, betraying them, so we know she can't be trusted. I think Monarch knows what's going up, but basically Monarch lets the kids go uh, at the beginning of this episode, uh, basically because they know nothing about. What is in that in that data? Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> so, but they're letting him go on like a short list of like we're gonna monitor you, which they're monitoring them probably through other means than May. But May is obviously informing them what the hell's going on. Yeah. But the point is, they wanted to go to the office see if there's another safe, see if there's another copy of maybe of the data or something there. Instead, there's no safe there. They there do, is a map. There is a that map. they knocked down with all the pins. <clears throat> Yeah, which was the same stupid. map as the other office. Yeah. yeah, he just ripped down the map. So you know, the safe should be behind this map. Oh, no but safe. He, it's like, yeah, you idiot. Like, how about you take pictures of around the office before just start ripping, ripping it off? Yeah. But, but basically, put the map back up. Uh, they figure out that the pin, the, the pinholes with putting light through uh, lined up on the map with uh, certain uh, spots like... Uh, San Francisco, so, Alaska, uh, and the next one is in Africa. Yep. So that's where they're going to head next to try and find their father, which is basically, he figured out, a, looks like he figured out a way to trace. Or a pattern. A pattern of where uh, Mudos are going to show up at. Because, yeah. like, the Mudo in Alaska, a monarch knew nothing about, and yet they found it, like, almost immediately. And um, the next one is probably, is, they think, is in Africa. That's where they think their dad is. That's where they're going to start heading to. Yep. Now, through all this, they let the kids go, but they kept Captain Lee or Sergeant Lee or whatnot, Kurt Russell's character mm-hmm. uh, in prison at Monarch and basically threatened, like, they'll bury him super, super deep or whatnot. Like, he's having a back and forth with the head of Monarch uh, casting threats. And basically, all we get out of that is that um, they still need him for something because he's telling them that Monarch is completely wrong. Yeah. Um, and has always been wrong. Now, what we don't know is this is, is this going to lead into, like, the mother's uh, thought in King of the Monsters was like, oh, no, the world belongs to the Titans. We should let them let them loose. Yeah. Or is it like, no, there's lots of mutos everywhere. You, and Monarch doesn't it's fucking in, know. And this is how... And they don't know where they are or how to control them. Yeah. Or Monarch is looking for a way to control or, or stop them. Yeah. And it's like, no, you can't. And maybe that's his thought process. Like, there's no stopping them. Like, this is their world. If they fucking show up... We're just, fucked. We're fucked. <laughs> um... So you get a little bit back and forth there, and then they do constantly mention his age again. Yeah, it's like, you're 90, you're super spry. Which means that they're probably going to give us a backlash of, like, the reason why he's 90-something and... And so spry. spry ...is due to some top-secret 
mission that went wrong, and maybe he was exposed to something that's keeping him uh, young and spryer than he should be. Yeah. Um, we'll have to see what happens on that, because the next episode is called Terrifying Miracles, uh, which is looks like another flashback to the past. Yes. So that could be, like, a Shaw, you know... Yeah. Uh, why he's 90 and acts like a 60-year-old. Because honestly, I thought, like, the first time they mentioned it, he just says, oh, oh good genes. Like, oh, all right, they're going to throw that away and just never explain that. And that's yeah. their explanation for it. It's just good genes. But since they brought up again, they might uh, be end up explaining it. Yeah, we'll so I think this is going to be a great payoff. So far, I, I'm really enjoying this show with the, its mysteries. Yeah, it's interesting that um, I don't think this will lead right up into King of the Monsters. I think they'll... Mm, uh, maybe. Because, because like, there is kind of like a disper- disparity with the Godzilla Monsterverse timeline. Because, like... King of Monsters came out after Godzilla and Kong, mm-hmm. but at the end of King of Monsters, all the all the move Titans are up and moving about, and then by Kong versus Godzilla, none of them are around anymore. Yeah, because there was like a mammoth, a spider, a bunch of other ones, a uh, Rudon, and all that. They're all up and about. Like, did Godzilla just tell them all to go to sleep and they all just obeyed and went back to sleep or something? Because he was alpha. Yeah, and, like, they traveled the world to get to where he was was at the end of the movie because they all popped up in different places around the world. Yeah. So, by Kong versus Godzilla, they're, no, no, they're nowhere around. And then the next Kong movie still looks like none of them are around. Yeah, well, so it looks like it's more of the under-earth. Uh, yeah, the Godzilla, versus, Godzilla X Con thing looks like more like a Kong movie than a Godzilla movie. Yeah, but they gotta put Godzilla because Godzilla sells. <laughs> yeah, um, so that's kind of a weird thing that they'll have to figure out. But I, this is interesting to get the background of Monarch, get, get find out exactly what they're trying to do, other mm-hmm. than just study the Titans. This uh, kind of get what their main objective is, which we haven't really figured that out yet. Yeah, because they don't want to kill them, kill the Titans. Uh, at least not with the, uh, what they were doing in the past. Originally, they seemed like they wanted to study them, but uh, what modern day monarch wants to do, we don't know for sure. Yep. Um, so we'll f- hopefully figure that out in the next episode or in the next couple episodes, and yeah, hopefully we can get me. rid of May soon. Yeah, she's a terrible character. She has to redeem herself somewhere. E- well, she's got a lot of redeeming to do. Yeah. But up next is the uh, Doctor Who, the third <laughs> special. Yeah, called this, The Giggle. Yeah, this is actually part of, like, there's Doctor Who, there's Doctor Who specials, so and this one is called Doctor Who Unleashed, which looks like the episode guide is, um, does it have an episode guide? No. Because <laughs> um, it's just these three, the f- kind of three slash four specials. The next one that's on Christmas Day is the beginning of season 14. Yeah, which is your traditional yeah. Doctor Who saves Christmas. Yeah, it's usually a Christmas special that starts off the new season. Yeah. And then they start off, like... The whole, the new normal season after that. Um, so this one actually uh, was fairly interesting. Uh, brings yes. back a really old, old villain. From uh, the 70s or 80s. I can't remember I which one. They showed a lot of, they showed a clip of the toy maker. Uh, yep. And faces from like the really old r- version of Doctor Who. And the cool thing is toy maker is played by Neil Patrick Harris, who... Hammed up the entire role and really liked it. Oh, it was great. He was a joy to watch in this episode. Um, But, again, I feel like the writing fell short by the end of the solution. Yeah. Um, Because, again, they also also did another thing where, like, I feel like they also written themselves kind of in a corner um, with the uh, regeneration, or what they're calling it now, the bi-generation. Yeah. Um, Which they've done, they kind of done before, because, like, a little background is, like, Matt Smith is considered the 11th Doctor, but technically he's the 13th. And in the original lore of Doctor Who is that he, Doctor Who uh, Time Lord can regenerate 13 times and that's it. David Tennant regenerated twice. He, like, he turned to David Tennant and then David Tennant regenerated back into David Tennant again. Yes. And then with Matt Smith, they did... Uh, it was... Well, with well, well, that's one rule. The first one was the, the crack in time regenerated Matt, old Matt Smith back into young Matt Smith on a, on a special. Yes, yes, yes. That's right. And then they finally addressed it with... River Song giving up her 13 regenerations to save his life. Yeah. And now Doctor Who has 13 more regenerations. Yeah. But now, by the end of this, where it was basically the toy maker shows up, he's made the world go crazy from, like, this little ch- uh, charm giggle from 1925 when he the first television experiment was done with 
a toy making like that stuff kind of really doesn't even make sense why that little thing being transmitted throughout TV forever and then when finally everybody's connected on all screens through the satellite system the world goes crazy yeah like, at that point didn't really make sense it was just that the toy maker is another being from another universe that can manipulate anything he wants in ours and is basically unstoppable except for the fact that he plays games and he's bound by the rules of any game that is played and if you challenge him to a game he has to accept so kind of like devil has to accept accept uh rock off like you can't yes there's no way <laughs> a he, rock off like you can't get you can't get out when you when you give the devil a uh, rock off challenge challenge you to a fiddle contest yeah so <laughs> basically the doctor challenges him to a game and then um doctor loses but then he's like oh wait we're one for one because i i won the first time we met back in 19 so well, or think, 80 something yeah and then like now you once now we're tied so it's best two out of three um and throughout all this like the time maker then jumps back to 2023 uh while doctor who uh has to go back there and then eventually he gets a hold of like it's not Torchwood, but it's a new group called Unit, which is basically, I guess, the succession of what Torchwood was. They have a big laser gun that they're blowing up a satellite with. Yep, to stop the giggle. But that was that was just a link in the chain, so it wasn't going to stop it for good. Mm-hmm. Um, Toymaker gets a hold of it, basically shoots the Doctor to kill him, because he's like, hey, if I'm going to play the Doctor again, I want to play the new Doctor. So he's trying, he's trying to force him to regenerate. But instead, he what they call bi-generates... And basically he splits in two, where the new Doctor shows up, but Den- T- D- David Tennant's still there. And for some reason, this is a weird thing, right? Because David Tennant still had a shirt, and he had a tie. Well, because he split, split in pretty two. evenly. So the new Doctor got his shirt, his un- or one of his He's- shirts, his tie, and then his underwear <laughs> and... Um, his shoes. His shoes. But David Tennant still had a shirt on. Because well, David Tennant had two shirts. He had his undershirt, and then he had his button-down shirt. It looked like it was a button-down shirt that the black it was, guy was wearing. Though. Yeah, so he had the over button-down. Oh, okay. So, well, yeah, so basically, Tennant had mul- wears multiple layers. So basically, the black guy's in his underwear with a t-shirt, with a shirt and a tie, and a, tie, a, tie around, a loose tie around his neck. Yes. This entire time, and just kicks. running around. And kicks. While David Tennant is, looks, pretty much looks like he's full, still fully dressed, but then he doesn't have shoes on. Um, but basically... This is where, like, it could have got clever, but they didn't. Where, like, they challenged him to a game. And so they had so they had to play the first game, which was catch. Well, it was only one game, and it was catch. Yeah. He said, let's play the very first game, which was the ball and, and catch. So it's like, you have to catch the ball. Whoever, if you drop the ball, you lose. And the toy maker either takes over or, the, or you get, they get a wish. The clever thing would have been, okay, cool. They throw the ball back and forth to each other. And then David Tennant and uh, Nuchi Gawata, I think is the guy's name, who's playing yeah. the new Doctor, uh, they should just play catch with themselves and, and exclude the toy maker, and that way he can't play, and that way he can't win. Um, that would have been clever, but instead they just play catch until the toy maker misses it and it goes off the roof of the building, which is like... Yeah. I was expecting it to go off the roof of the building and then somebody would jump after it or something, but it's like, oh, he just missed it. He lost the game. And then he got... Folded, folded it up, up and, and turned into a, uh, and put into a toy box. Yeah, it's like really like that's not very clever. Yeah, I was hoping because Doctor Who is usually like about clever and yeah. you know having some thought, but this was not. And <laughs> that. because Doctor Tennant's wish was David Tennant's wish was hey for the toy maker never to be uh, allowed in this universe ever again. Toy maker gets folded up, folds up, and falls into his little toy box, and then he takes it and stashes it. But uh, the new doctor gets a wish, which was he was able to duplicate the TARDIS. TARDIS. And so now David Tennant's going to stay with Donna's family and like live a life and like just sit still. And the new doctor's going to go off on adventures. But here's the thing they both have TARDISes. There's two doctors now in this universe. Yeah. You put yourself in this, whole, this corner where it's like. Okay, if anything bad happens that's unbelievable, they can always just bring David Tennant back to fucking think, hey, no, there's two Doctors. Okay, it's and there's been... two TARDISes, and there's two screwdrivers, and, like, it's yeah. just double. And also, the other thing, like, that we didn't kind of like about it was the fact that, like, David Tennant was worrying about how he did, like he wouldn't have a TARDIS, he didn't have a screwdriver, like, he's nothing without those things. Yeah. And it's like, Matt Smith's introduction was, 
I don't have a TARDIS. I don't have a screwdriver. I have 20 minutes to save the world. I'll do it. Yeah. Like, and I'll do it cleverly. And, like, he had no whims about, I'm not confident. I can't do things without my tools. I'm nothing without my tools. And David Tennant's sitting here like, I can't do anything if I don't. I'm nothing without the TARDIS or without yeah. the screwdriver. And it's like, but, but, like, he's grown and should know that he can do more. He, he should have all his memories after Tennant. Yeah. To know, like, oh, I got over this. I had a wife. I, you know, been on these adventures. This was false. It was, I don't know. It felt very wishy-washy. Yeah, and also, like, how when the toy maker was taunting him in the past with, like, just going over the past with Donna and him saying, hey, this is what happens to all his companions. After you, and, like, they hey, all died. Like, and it's like... Well, he's like, look, Amy Pond died. It's like, she didn't die. She chose to go to the past and live her life with Rory. Yeah. Uh, and she lived a long, happy life and wrote a book. Yeah. Like, she didn't die. And, like, he's seeing, seeing all the companions. I was like, they didn't die. And the doctor doesn't really correct a lot of it. Like, he corrects the Claire one, saying, like, well, she's living in the last second of her life or something. But, like, he doesn't necessarily, like, say this is all bullshit. Like, these people aren't dead. Dead. They're alive. They may be alive in some some form or some way I've saved them somehow. But, like, they didn't die a horrible, horrible death like he's pointing out. Exactly. So it's also making me feel like, did the writers like not pay attention to what happened in the past? I mean, or did they forget and yeah. just kind of like, oh, they just all died. Yeah. So again, like the writing in this isn't always the best. Yeah. Not just it's because a weak. <laughs> it's, not, it's not Stephen Moffat doing it anymore, and like he's laid down a lot of good lore for it. Um, I am excited to see where they go next with uh, the new doctor. With the new doctor. Uh, which will start off season 14th with The Church on Ruby Road. Which is our Christmas special. Yeah. Um, so it will be interesting to see where they go there. Um, hopefully the writing gets better, but who knows. I, I hope so. I really do. Because like, Cause this he, one seems like a more charming doctor, a little flirty. Yeah, and hopefully he's more, hopefully he's more clever. Like David Tennant was yes. clever in his own... In his own way, but it was very angry, and, and, clever. Yeah, and he was ruthless. But, like, Matt Smith was like, I don't have to have all the traditional toys. I can figure this out. Yeah. Where, I like, use my big brain. Yeah, where, like, I feel like David King evolved to that before he turned into Matt Smith. But it's like, why did they throw that out in the writing of this episode? Yeah, it was very... Yeah. <laughs> so now we we'll move on to uh, movies. Courtney promised that we'd watch a Christmas movie, so we watched what's yes. on Prime, which is the new Eddie Murphy movie called Candy Cane Lane. Yep. Uh, it looked kind of weak. Our friend said it was pretty bad, but like honestly, it wasn't as bad as he made us think it was. Yes. Um, Ooh. it's definitely not up to the level like the Santa Claus being like the Santa Claus when it came out. It's like yeah, it's not a level of theater worthy. It is a good sit around the TV popcorn family, family movie yeah. that you would find on TV back in the day. Um, it well, was just, it was just fine. It did its job of getting you ready and in the spirit of the Christmas times. Yeah. And I would say it probably had a few editing issues where like, they had oh, there was a lot of editing they had story beats that weren't in the right area. There yeah. was definitely, they, you see, definitely see where they spent all their animation money and CG money at. Uh, and where they lacked. It was not at the beginning. Yeah, because at the beginning, for some reason, like, they tried to emphasize Christmas in California, and they had, like, sand dune surfers jumping off a of sand dune, which was done totally bad in, like, it a was CG really way. And really it's like. weird looking. And it's also like, in LA, nobody's fucking doing that because there's not sand dunes in LA. Yeah, it's like, just have them on surfboards. Just get a couple of surfers. Or skating on the, on the boardwalk. Or, yeah, skating, either rollerblading, or, um, you know, then a lawn boarding or something. But I don't understand why they're like, yeah, we're going to sand dune. We're going to make this a thing. It's like, why? <laughs> yeah, they're also like in El Segundo. Uh, El Segundo. At, like LA or whatnot. And they constantly, like, I noticed in the background, like, they had, they constantly showed a mur mural of uh, Teddy Roosevelt saying, competition is the uh, enemy of joy uh -huh. or the thief of joy. And they constantly had stuff in the background, like, they were, he was right down the street, there's a guy with a surfboard walk, with a big long board walking around. I was like, that's not what happens in California. Yeah. Like, you're not walking around a downtown area with a giant surfboard. No. The only time you see that is at the beach. Yeah. Because they're going to go surfing at the beach, not, oh, I'm just going to carry my longboard so people think I'm a surfer. 
Yeah. It was weird. So basically this... So it showed, like, I thought it was going to come into play more, but they kept showing that old-timey music hall. Like, yeah. a lot, and it never popped. Like, yeah, they never did anything with it. Yeah, it was just weird. Um, basically, uh, this movie is starring Eddie Murphy, uh, co-stars uh, where our antagonist is uh, Jillian Bell, who plays Pepper. Uh, Jillian Bell has been, as a comedic actress, she's in, like, uh, what I remember from is The Night Before, Seth Rogen and... Uh, oh. Who are she's like Seth Rogen's wife? Yes, yes. Um, she's really funny, but basically, Candy Cane Lane, which uh, if I don't know if you're, I think almost every community has this, but like when I lived in San Diego, there was a street called Candy Cane Lane, Mm -hmm. and that street everybody decorated their houses like crazy for Christmas, and then in the evening, the whole like that That street would be completely backed up because traffic would drive through it to stare at the houses. They basically take that concept and put a candy cane lane in El Segundo, uh, California, and um, but the difference here is that this big the street, which is also very competitive with like doing the lighting of the houses, have a competition for a, the best house. There's going to be a televised competition for like a hundred grand for the winner. Yeah, well, that's new this year's yeah. the hundred grand. Yeah, prize. The, fact, the fact that there's a cash prize, it's not just the neighborhood. You're the winner of this year. Yeah, which thing. they had in the past, and for some reason. The winner for like the past four years was for Guy use inflatables. uses inflatables, which I'm like, mm, that's some bullshit. Yeah. I t- very much doubt like, a house. The Jewish house just, looked better than his. The house looked amazing. I'm like, that Jewish house should have won. The Matrix house it's thing should have won. won over him. Because like the other guy was all inflatables. Eddie Murphy's house is all like handcrafted wood, wood carving. But it's not like he carved it. So, well, some of the stuff he did, you saw him like painting the candy canes. Yeah, but the thing was, and... like, I didn't get the impression that he was a wood a woodworker because yeah. he had a day job as a salesperson for a company that just has a name. He has no idea what he was selling, but basically, he gets laid off with the rest of the uh, staff. Well, it's half of the sales team. Yeah, and like, basically, it looks like they're white. They're clearing out the whole building because we don't know what he does for a living. We just know that he sales. Don't know what he was selling, but he got he lost his job. Yeah. Um, and so his big answer to, I lost my job is I'm going to win a hundred thousand dollars when I live in El Segundo, California. It's like a hundred thousand dollars does not solve your fucking problem. No, it solves the problem of the light bill at the end of the month. Yeah. That's all it's going to like, be. It does, it, like his wife's about to get a promotion, which is great. So then, you know, that can kind of help like while he goes and finds another job, which he should easily be able to do if he was a top salesman of this corporation thing, whatever the yeah, hell it is. Yeah, it's like did. just... I'll pop on your LinkedIn, update your status yeah. and resume, and start, you know, searching around. <laughs> but oh, no, let's well, focus on winning this silly competition. Yeah, he thinks 100, 100 grand is going to save Christmas and save and solve all those problems, which, like, reality, no. It should be, like, a million dollars or something. Yeah, I mean, half so. a million or yeah. something or, you know. But basically, within all this, like, his kid, his two teenage kids are kind of, like, mad, whatever. and But his youngest kid is, like, all in with him. And well, it's because she's still young enough yeah. to be like, the she, joys of Christmas. She still enjoys the joys of Christmas, yeah. And so they end up going, looking for Christmas decorations and find this mysterious shop underneath the highway. Because that's where you find the best Christmas decorations. Yeah. It's from a hobo. Jillian under- Bell is the proprietor of this place, and she's uh, basically an elf called Pepper. Excuse me. An elf called Pepper, who sells him a tree that's the 12 days of Christmas. Which looks pretty cool. In my- yeah, it looks like a giant tuna can that he has to take home it's and amazing. unravel like a tuna can. And then it pops up, and then basically when he finally gets it to light up, it spins to where all the 12 Days of Christmas animate. It's really cool. So, I, I'm like, so if did, that was real, that would like, be epic. They did a good job on that. Like, you can tell, like, they spent a good job on that animation. They spent a good job on the animation of the porcelain uh, characters. Yeah. What it turns out is that he signed this contract with his receipt. That basically he has to play some game with Pepper, uh, which turns out you have to find all the rings, or he's going to get turned into a porcelain figure for her to keep in her uh, uh, collection. Because collection. basically, she used to be Santa's favorite elf, but she took the naughty or nice list a little bit too seriously and started making everybody naughty and trying to punish everyone. So Santa kicked her out, and then she quit. Or he demoted her to reindeer stall duty. And she quit and then started doing this and started basically collecting souls. <laughs> yes. Um, so it then turns out that he needs to collect uh, rings. We all think he needs to collect the five golden rings uh, in order not to turn into the stall. And they kind of like this mix up of stuff where like he lets the family in on it. 
Yeah, and this the, is where the editing gets. And the walked. family helps him get like three rings, and then it goes to like them saying, "Well, you didn't tell us the whole truth. What you only wanted us, you only told us like, so you could solve it." But like he didn't do anything to get the other three rings. Yeah, the kids all did it, and then it's like finally he tells them everything that hey, if he loses, he's going to turn into this doll or this porcelain statue. Like the, yeah, like oh, and he characters. also steals the porcelain dolls. Yeah, he steals the dolls her. and the tower. And the interesting thing is there's three main dolls, which is one played by um, Nick Offerman, who's uh, Pip, Chris Red, who's the Lamplighter, and Robin Thede, who's Cordelia, who are like these three main characters. And then there's the carolers who are who happen to be pentatonics. Yeah. Uh, so they just kind of chime in every time somebody mentions a song. And they sing the song because they, they can't help themselves. Yeah, because it's pentatonics anyway. Yeah. And I did like how they kept telling them to shut up. <laughs> yeah, they kept yelling at them to shut up because they kept singing every time somebody mentioned it, somebody went to a song. Um, the effects of the animation on the on the porcelain statues were really cool, except... Like, they kind of messed up with the ending where sometimes you hear the porcelain sound of it shifting. Yeah, which is And other is times you don't. Uh, so it's kind of weird there. So it's like... It was it's, a choice. It's <laughs> almost 100%, but not quite there. Yeah. Um, but basically, um, the dolls ask him to take them. He, take, he steals them from Pepper Shop so they can all help him find the rings. The family gets involved. The three kids find rings. He needs to find one more. And it turns out, no, he has to have... 40 rings because the song repeats 12 times. Uh, so, so math. So, yeah, they do math, and it turns out like he has till eight o'clock, and like right, like five minutes before is when they find out they have to get 40 rings. And well, it's it, about 10, 15 minutes before. Yeah. Uh, and so then for some reason, Pepper runs the muck and lets all the, all the birds in the song like start flying around. Yeah. And they lets the drummers out and all that. It's like, so you're letting your, you're giving them the chance. chance to get the rings. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, and Santa comes down during this time. Yeah, and basically says, I can't do nothing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you it's you like, signed the contract. It's like, thanks, Santa. Way to help a bro out. Yeah, well, he, like, helps a little bit with catching rings and whatnot, and then, like, you don't know what how they how they solve the problem at the end, and, like, even at the end when the kid's like, I we got 38 rings, like... How? How did you get 38 rings? We did not see 38 rings ha Yeah, in, in it would have been better if they uh, somehow convince the... Uh, the neighborhood to help them. Yeah. And then they're, they all the neighborhood comes together because Christmas spirit. Everyone comes together for the Christmas spirit. Yeah. And so it would have been better. <laughs> so it was more like the neighborhood was like more of like, he says a thin veil, like friendship of, oh, we're just competing. Ha ha ha. But like, I hate you. Yeah. Uh, it would be better like, yeah, they got all the neighbors involved to like help get, gather all the rings. And that would be more believable instead of all the neighborhood and everybody there at the parade for the Candy Cane Lane. Oh, uh, prize winning yeah. would have made more sense. Which turned out the prize was $100,000 worth of tacos. Yes. <laughs> Which is like, what the fuck? Tacos? So it's like... It better be damn good tacos. That's all I have to say. <laughs> yeah, so they end up collecting rings throughout this chaos and stuff and like uh, the song the kid wrote with his tuba, which is basically... A rendition of another song, as all hip hop music is. It's actually a pretty decent Christmas song, mm -hmm. uh, which I can tell. Like they spent money on that, and the and those animations we're talking on. Um, but like, kid says, "Oh, we have thirty eight rings. We're running out of time." And we then Santa Claus is like, "Oh, you have two rings." And it's like, "Oh, it's going to be their wedding rings." Yeah. It's like, "Oh yeah, it's the, their wedding ring." And then they technically win. He gets he Eddie Murphy turns back into a normal person instead of being a porcelain doll. Everyone else gets to cha change back as well because the little girl uh, wrote a letter to Santa wishing all the dolls, dolls come back yeah. to life. Because it's a child's wish. Yeah. So Santa, played by David Allen Greer, changes them all back. They all get in his like car sled because apparently Santa doesn't need reindeer anymore. Yep. And Except they, for Pip. Yeah. And they make it like which is weird. Pip was gonna leave, but like you see him walking down the street at the end. Yeah, because it's also weird that Pip's the only one from like the 1800s we're talking about like charles dickinson and the 1800s and all that and all the other dolls are like modern day people who yeah. are just stuck who are turned into a lamplighter and a, and like a, a, a woman just, from that from an old period right yeah. for the christmas village look so like pip's the only one that comes back wearing his exact outfit as the doll and then he just wanders down the street and then comes back because he has no family it's like so Santa couldn't do anything, like take him somewhere, <laughs> or like, or transport him back to his his old life. Like, yeah, that was like a weird 
uh, writing loophole they forgot about. Yeah, because it's just like he comes back the next day for Christmas dinner and gives him a goose and a box of wine. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, again... So, the wife... So, at the very end, the wife gets her promotion, which, yep. yay. But what have been better is, like, yeah, she got a phone call for her promotion, which we all knew she was getting. Anyways, but, like, a phone call from his, like, old job, like, trying to get him back, because they're... Yeah, because the way they wrapped it up was just that the the, elf, the toy shop that Pepper owned is now under new management, which is under his management, which, like, they never really addressed that he was going to take it over. It's just yeah. he now runs the toy shop, and that's his new job, which is, like, that doesn't make any sense. Weird. It's a little weird. So, it, so it's like that's where the writing falls apart and where it doesn't like this. Like the Santa Claus was like a good family movie, but like everything made sense so in the place as they set it up. Yeah. Where here there's things that fall apart in it because they don't want to explain it. And there's just tropes that they throw in there to add conflict that make no sense in today's world where maybe back in the day parents were really pushy about, oh, you have to go to my alma mater. You have to go to my college. Yeah. And like the parents in this whole movie are pushing the oldest daughter, like, you have to go to UC. It's like, why? If she wants to go to Notre Dame or another school, they're going to another fucking school. Yeah, exactly. It's um, like, especially a better school. <laughs> especially nowadays when more parents are like, get the fuck out of my house so I can have, <laughs> I spend my money, my time on doing me. other stuff. <laughs> where like this whole time parents are like, no, we want you home every night for, for dinner while you go to college. And the kid's like, no, I'm going to college out of state. Yeah, it's like, I want the full actual college experience, yeah. which makes sense. Um, So, yeah. overall, it's like I said, it's a fun little family popcorn flick just to throw on. I think the kids will still like it. Um, is it going to be one of those that you're going to watch every year? Probably, Probably not. not. But if you want to watch like a new kind of Christmas movie, I think this fills the role pretty well. Yeah, I mean, it, and it was, you know, for a brand new movie, it fit the time period it's, it's set in. It has some whimsy to it, some decent animation, but it's like... If you put all your animation in a few things, don't bother doing cheesy shit elsewhere where it looks terrible. Yes. Because when the opening shot is really bad, I'm like, oh my god, this movie's going to be terrible. And like, luckily, it wasn't at that level all the way through. I'm like, okay, okay the animation of the statues is done really well. They're done on a different timing, so like they, they move a little bit more stiffly. It's like they're trying to mimic stop-motion animation, but it's all CG animation, so it's not done perfectly. But... It sounds and, and works well. There's some bad dubbing with the sun in the band. Yes, was, that was awful. It was so in your face on how bad like they clearly the dub was. Get, they clearly couldn't get the lines out in that sequence or even vi get video of them saying the lines, so they just dubbed it. And it's so it bad. There was well. no sync, and you could see it yeah. so blatantly. Um, it was bad. Yeah. Other than that, I mean... Like you said, it's a decent, like, Sunday movie for the family. Yeah. Um, but we said, like, this wouldn't be on my list to watch every year. It's better, as far as Eddie Murphy movies go, I mean, like, I think he got his, like, comeback with uh, I Am a Dolomite movie. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, but, like, a lot of the other family movies he's made after, like, um, Eddie Murphy, uh, after, like, The Nutty Professor and whatnot were a lot, were a lot of garbage. Mm-hmm. This one, definitely, I wouldn't put it in, in that the, that pile. It's better than The Haunted Mansion, the other stuff he's done. Um, but yeah. it's not as bad as like Daddy Daycare or like Bruno, or like the Bruno, it's not Bruno Mars. It's, oh yeah, the, the, the one that killed the alien, the one that killed his career. It's not as bad as that by any means. Yeah, um, but but yeah, yeah, this was a movie that he needed to pay for something, so he <laughs> yeah. he has ten, he has ten kids. He's got to pay for some something, something for, for somebody. Me. Yes, yeah. All right. needed a down payment on a house. <laughs> so um, now moving on to some gaming news. We have the Game Awards this past week. Yes. Uh, there were a lot of announcements a lot of, and some drama out of all of it. I mean, the main drama being that uh, what the reporter watched last night was saying that, like, developers only had 30 seconds to give a speech before they were told to like, get off the stage. About 60 seconds. Yeah, 60 seconds. Like, 30, 30 seconds, and then the please uh, wrap it up sign would come on. And then by 60 seconds, it would be flashing at them to, to get off stage. Where they gave most of their time to advertisements and game announcements, where people are like, "This is supposed to be about game awards and celebrating the developers." Why of their achievements of of the last year. year? Why are we giving all the time to advertisers and to announce stuff? Yeah, and to and um, celebrities, celebrities and to friends promote, of promote the people. Stuff, yeah. yeah, to promote movies and other and other stuff. It's like, yeah, it kind of doesn't make sense, but mm -hmm. I, I understand like. 
the Game Awards has become like, hey, the new premieres are going to show up at this uh, show. Yep. And none of those are going to be made, which was fine. But originally, it was like, these are what happens at the commercial break times. They're going to show this type of stuff. Yeah, which they don't really have commercial well, breaks. Well, now it's streamed, right? Yeah. But, like, to what people are saying, what they're trying to really say is, like, this is turning into what Spike turned the Game Awards into, mm-hmm. which was, here's a concert with a bunch of fucking hey, man, celebrity that, people. That guy on the flute was amazing. Yeah, but he I mean, needed more airtime in my opinion. What I'm talking about more so with Spike was it was like here's here's like Run DMC or here's some music artist. Well, yeah, that yeah. Made yeah. no sense of being there performing some fucking rock song or something. This is turned into like aside for the performances of, of the songs that they do which is good like flute guy fucking rocks it every year. So Oh, far. he's amazing. He needs um, to like get his salary doubled. Like give that guy a huge raise. He Town tent, we'll watch again. <laughs> yeah, like rushing people off the stage who like won the award for best accessibility and they're trying to talk about accessibility and say get the fuck off the stage. Yeah, that's so we can advertise not stuff. a it's great like, look. You're not doing doing something right here. Yeah. But basically, but, uh, you have all the winners? Yeah, I have all the winners. Yeah, so. So game of the year. Game of the year went to Boulder Gates 3, which, which a lot of people expected. Yep, yeah, which I was happy about in my yeah, opinion. I'm sure a lot of people with, uh, were upset about Z- uh, Z- Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, but to be fair, Tears of the Kingdom is a re- is probably one of the first uh, real sequels Zelda had other than Majora's Mask. Mm-hmm. But Majora's Mask did go to a completely new world. Well, map, this one... Where this is the old world map yes. with a new upper and lower level, which is kind of a cool twist on the dark world, light world type of... Yep, type and of then concept. the crafting ability, And too. the crafting gave a new kind of gameplay to it, but... Again, you are just reusing the same assets you use with another game. There's no no major improvements other than gameplay. Yeah. Uh, best game direction went to Alan Wake. Um, I haven't finished it, but I do think it's a very good game. Mm-hmm. As far as like doing kind of a new version of like a horror game, I feel like they did really well. Best narrative went to Alan Wake Two, which kind of makes sense because it's a very narrative game. A lot very of people narrative. don't like it for it being what they call a walking simulator or. Not having a lot of gameplay elements because it's a st- very story-based driven game. Best art direction went to Alan Wake 2, which I would have given that to Hi-Fi Rush. Or, I agree. Or even uh, Legend of Zelda, probably. Yeah. Um, Hi-Fi Rush probably should have won that. I don't think Alan Wake should have got art direction for that. It does have a good direction, but I think that... It's very really visually gorgeous, and it fills that uh, gorgeous dark horror look. But, yeah, for, like, a new art direction, new look, I think Hi-Fi Rush should have gotten it, or Zelda. I, I feel like they went way too heavy on giving Alan Wake a lot of stuff where it's like, Alan Wake could win one award. And it, it would have been fine. It should not have won, like, a ton. Yeah. Uh, best score in music went to Final Fantasy sixteen. We haven't played that. I'm... But, you know, the Final Fantasy uh, soundtracks are always beautiful. They're gorgeous. They're fully orchestrated. But whether so... or not... Um, like, there's some Final Fantasy uh, soundtracks that are like, boom, you know exactly what game that's from. Final yeah, Fantasy you seven, know. eight, uh, stuff from nine and like and uh, two Ten. and six and whatnot. Like those are those those have some things that like everybody hears and they know it's Final Fantasy. I don't know if the music from Final Fantasy sixteen screams that. Whereas like the Legend of Zelda uh, score was really really well. Mm-hmm. It was very. It's clearly an update from what. Breath of the Wild was, and like you hear it, you know it's Zelda. I thought that was probably that one probably should have got that. Yeah. Uh, Hi-Fi Rush did get audio design, which yes, which is weird to get not to win best score of music, but to win best audio design. Yeah. Um, but I mean that's mainly probably because the gameplay mechanic built into the audio of the of matching up the beat. Mm-hmm. Um, best performance went to Boulder Gate Street to Neil Newborn. Um, he's the guy who plays the vampire. Yes. That everyone's lusting over. I'm like, why? He tried to bite me, so I'm yeah. like, fuck him in we my have, games. We have, we have to play. We have to play all the way through to see if he becomes likable. Um, I'm like, mm, I just see you for a few things, and then I might like, go back to camp. Yeah, I thought it was where the Idris Elbow was was nominated because, like, dude, that's DLC, and like, that's not like a game length of performance. Mm-hmm. Um, the other char- other people who were nominated did, did make sense because uh, they were like main characters for their whole game and whatnot. Um, but it's cool that he won for Boulder Skate 3. Yeah. Uh, game... Anything, like, for more for Boulder Skate, I'm like, go, go, go. <laughs> uh, games for Impact, Tashia. I don't know what that is. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 
<laughs> best ongoing game, uh, which this one I don't think should have won at all, was Cyberpunk 2077. Yeah. Because they weren't updating it for being an ongoing update for the game. They were fixing, fixing shit bugs. <laughs> most of the time, dude. And yeah, they added a few things, especially, and most of the things were added with 2.0 and uh, I think the 1.7 update. But yeah. like, there wasn't. But, uh, like, this, the main update was DLC, and I don't think it should have yeah, gotten that. Not, I think the Final game. Fantasy XIV should have, because they revamped and really updated that whole game. Yeah, especially, like, when the competition is Apex Legend, Final Fantasy XIV, Fortnite, and Genshin Impact, which these are games-as-a-service game. And Cyberpunk is not a games-as-a-service game, and so for some reason it won that. Yeah. Um, best indie game was Sea of Stars, which is a really good uh, 2D sprite. You wanted uh, Dredge to win, though. I did want Dredge to win. Uh, that was a game. cool, like, kind of Lovecraftian horror. And I, I didn't think it, it was going to win against Sea of Stars. I thought it would have won oh. Best Debut Indie Game, but Cocoon won that instead oh. of Dredge, uh, which I haven't played Cocoon. Um, best mobile game is Honkai Star Rail, uh, which makes sense. A lot of people play the Honkai games. Community sport was Baldur's Gate three. Yes, which that one I feel like. Excuse me. Phantom that was a good place for Phantom Liberty, because they kept uh, updating the game to support the community there in um, uh, Cyberpunk. So it should just be it shouldn't be Cyberpunk Phantom Liberty. It should just been Cyberpunk. Yeah. Because Phantom Liberty was just the DLC, and I think that's how they snuck Cyberpunk into the award ceremonies. Well, well, the DLC came out as a brand new game, so it's like DLC is not a new game; it's an add-on. And yes. yes, they added a bunch of stuff and new mechanics to the game to change it with it, but I don't think Cyberpunk deserves to get nominated for rewards for a DLC that came out a month or two before the rewards, rather than when the game actually came out. I agree. Um, Best VR. VR, Resident Evil the Village, which makes sense. Y- yeah. <laughs> uh, innovation and accessibility makes sense with Forza Motorsport because Microsoft's been pushing that uh, as one of their main staples. Best action game was Armor Core 6 by uh, From Software, which that's been getting a lot of uh, notability. Best action adventure game, uh, Legends of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, which that makes sense there. Um, so when they announced that, I knew for a fact that they weren't going to give Game of the Year. It's like, mm-hmm. you just gave them Best Action Adventure Game, you're not going to give them Game of the Year. You're, you gave that to them so you could give it to someone else, uh, but give the year to someone else. And yeah. not. not because when they do game awards, even the Oscars, you can tell like they give an award to someone else to say, "Hey, you got this best thing here," so you're not getting get the top award. Yeah, I except for a director, it's usually best director, <laughs> best movie, best screenplay yeah. is usually going to get like eight times out of ten will get the best movie award. Yeah, best RPG was Boulder Gates Three, uh, which makes sense. Uh, fighting game. Surprisingly, Street Fighter 6. I would have thought Mortal Kombat 1 really got that because their narrative is better. Yeah. Uh, family game. Super Mario Brothers. Wonder makes sense because that's just like a throwback right back to the old school gaming. Mm-hmm. Uh, racing game. Motorsport makes sense. Forza, yeah. It's hard to beat Forza for a uh, racing game nowadays. Now, what's interesting here is that best sim strategy game went to Pikmin 4, which technically it is a strategy game. It's just not... In the same uh, camp, I would say, as Advance Wars, City Skylines, Company Heroes, or Fire Emblem. Yeah. Um, it's a very unique twist on that genre, which, though, it's interesting that it won. I thought that was actually kind of a cool choice. Multiplayer game, Boulder's Gate 3. Um, yeah, yeah, that makes sense if you have, you if you have can... a group of friends to play with. <laughs> yeah, so you can fill out your party and yeah. just play with the party and not the npcs <laughs> content creator of the year iron mouse that makes sense like she was at one point the most uh the highest highest, stream, highest one point. stream in the year uh esports stuff don't care about any of that so we're not going to talk about any of the esports stuff because we don't know who any of those people are most anticipated game is final fantasy rebirth which makes sense everybody's waiting for them to finish up that story uh best adaptation which was like game to to TV, to TV or film. What winner was Last of Us TV which, show? Which yes, one hundred percent. Yes. Uh, player's voice cho- of voice, which is one that everybody voted on, uh, went to Boulder's Gate three, which makes sense. Yep. It sounds like one everyone wins, but those are all the winners. Yep. Uh, now the announcements that happened, uh, a lot of games got announced. I know Sega had a big announcement of a bunch of like old school games coming back and like their new new rendition of uh, Jet Set Radio. Yep. So here's all the announcements that were made at the awards not in order just 
random. So Monster Hunter Wilds uh, was revealed, but that's not coming out till 2025. Yep. Um, here, Hideo Kojima um, and Jordan Peele are doing a collab with Xbox for a new game, and it looks like it's going to be a horror game. But their trailer, air As quotes, doesn't show, you doesn't show jack shit. It's just two people. It's performances. Yeah, doing a performance of a little poem. So, yeah. <laughs> we'll see when that game comes out. Uh, God of War Ragnarok announced some DLC that's coming out this month, which will be free. Well, we have it. it's out now, actually. Uh, well, it came out the 12th? Yeah, it came out the same day uh, it was announced. Uh, coming December 12th. Well, never mind. So it comes out in two days. <laughs> two days. Well, fine. But pretty much it came so out. So when you, when you hear this, it will be out in free DLC if you own uh, God of War Ragnarok. Yeah. Which is nice. I thought that was nice of them yeah. to do that, to give a, a free DLC. And for that DLC, it looks like it's a, a run roguelike. Uh, yeah, like the Valhalla it, Nephilim DLC, where basically yeah. it's a roguelike uh game uh, play put in there. Yeah, which I could see why they kind of did that for free, but that should be fun mm -hmm. if you like roguelike. And it's free, so yay. Uh, next is Marvel's Blade, which is still in development, um, so who knows when that will come out, or if it will come yeah, out. It's being made by Arcane Studios, um, so who knows if it's going to be good, because Arcane's last game was garbage. Um, so we don't know what they're going to, how the quality of that's really going to be. Yeah, it, and that was just a cinematic trailer, so you don't know yeah. Anything what's going to happen. So Sega, Sega Next Generation Montage was one that had montage a bunch of games. Yeah, that it showed were five games. So it's Jet Set Radio, Shinobi, Golden Axe, Streets of Rage, and Crazy Taxi, and more are going are currently in development for Sega. Uh, which would be nice to get a new, like, uh, a new Streets of Rage would be really cool. We had Streets of Rage 4, which was the arcade uh, game that came out. Yeah, I that think, was lots year. of fun. Uh, Jet Set Radio would be cool to have another new, a new updated version of that. Yeah. Uh, Finals was announced, which actually released the same day, um, which is just like a sh hero shooter almost, basically, is what it looked like to me. Yeah. Um, no Man's Sky announced, or Hello Games announced their fantasy version of No Man's Sky called Light No Fire, which is basically a fantasy world that's probably going well up to the size of, of the universe, of the infinite universe, who knows. Um, it depends on how much procedurally generated content they have, because honestly, procedurally generated content clearly does not work yeah it didn't really work for for no man's sky it doesn't work for starfield really that well because even when they have pre-generated cells that they can precisely generate in different areas you end up getting a lot of repeat content That's yes boring uh final fantasy 16 dlc was announced uh rise of the ronin uh is a samurai game and that's coming out in march, march. Um, Skull so, and Bones finally gets a release date. Because they want to get rid of it so bad. February 16th, which I'm pretty sure nobody's going to buy that. No no one's going to play it. Just the I, journalists uh, are. Hopefully Xbox will put it on Game Pass so you can Well, just... Ubisoft will probably have it on their service, then eventually Game Pass. Yeah. Um, Lost Record, Bloom and Rage. That looked pretty good, though. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, it's like, it's from the creators don't know, the creators who did, uh, My Life is Strange. Yeah, Life is Strange. Life is strange. Yeah. I, I really like the last Life is Strange True, True Colors. Colors. It was really good. I enjoyed that one. So I'm hoping this one will be, like, on par with that. Dragon Ball's getting another game, which... Which looks bad. <laughs> um, this is weird, because it's called Fortnite Rocket Racing, which Rocket Racing is developed by the people who made Rocket League, mm -hmm. but when you want, if you want to download Rocket racing you have to download Fortnite with it yeah but the weird thing is like on the game store it's a separate game so i'm like do you, it says includes Fortnite and all the versions of downloading so okay. it's like is this in Fortnite or is Fortnite a separate game and this is a separate game that you ha that's forcing you to bundle it with Fortnite so Fortnite can feel like they're still relevant and say hey we look we got all these new downloads yeah i because, think it's the latter because Fortnite is technically dying they're losing uh players because people are getting bored with it that's why they keep injecting new pop culture bullshit into that game constantly because yeah. they have no ideas of where to go with the gameplay. And now it looks like someone else came out with a new game and they're working with Epic, so Epic is pairing it with Fortnite, which will boost their download numbers of Fortnite, uh, which sucks. <laughs> um, Ori, the developer... Uh, or Ori's Ori developer. developer. Moon Studios uh, made a new game called No Rest for the Wicked, which looked like a fantasy Diablo-like ARPG. It looked good. I think it'll be good, hopefully. 
Um, Bioware veterans reveal new. Oh, the veterans of X Bioware developers. Yes. It's a new sci-fi RPG called Exodus, which they didn't really show much. Yeah. Um, a lot of the new games, they didn't really show a lot. Again, it's a lot of like cinematic trailers or cinematic mixed with gameplay, which is very little gameplay. So like, you don't have a sense of what these games are. Yeah. Um, Big Walk was like a community type play game by the Untitled Goose developer. Uh, un, was that Unseen? Unseen. Yeah, I didn't really see that trailer, so I don't know much about that one. Okay. Uh, Dead by Daylight has a spinoff yes. with uh, Supermassive Games. So Supermassive so did stupid. did uh, the Quarry and like a lot of those like movie uh, movie choice games. Movie choice games, like movie, like uh, I don't know, did, did the Dark Picture series. Yeah, kind of like the Dark Picture series, and like so they did the last game they did was the Quarry, which I love. They're doing the a quarry. new game called Casting of Frank Stone. Yes. Which is going to be hopefully be like. The core, but we said the Dead by Daylight universe would be interesting how they work the Dead by Daylight lore because there's a lot of it apparently. Yeah, depends how much like people how the dark know. entity fits in and, and like the generators and oh, I think that that's going to be fun and good. Yeah, there's I'm another excited. Jurassic Park game coming out, which <laughs> don't care about Jurassic Park. Visions of Mana, uh, which is a, a first Mana game I played was Secret of Mana. I didn't realize mm-hmm. it was part of a series, but there's just hundreds of Mana games out there. I don't know if this is a remake. Oh, it's a brand new game of the Mana series. Okay, so it's a so, new game uh, coming. But it's basically your anime uh, style. Your anime it's a, it's, style. It's an anime style RPG. Basically, originally the Mana series was a Super Nintendo like 2D sprite game. Mm-hmm. So like this is like this reminds me of, like um, Dragon Quest. Like the anime characters probably oh, be set yeah, in their yeah. own costumes. They'll they'll never change outfits, and they'll tell a story like through that. Uh, Hellblade 2 got a uh, release window of sometime in 2024. Yep. Uh, late 2024, mm-hmm. which will probably get pushed back till early 2025. Yeah. Uh, the indie game uh, Brothers, A Tale of Two Sons, is getting a remake. Mm-hmm. Um, don't know what this Den of Wolves is. That was this is from a Swedish developer. I guess that got announced. <laughs> uh, Black Myth Wukong has a release date. That's the one with yeah. like the Chinese the, monkey, monkey King and a lot of uh, yeah. The Asian. Journey to the West. West. Yeah, that's uh, this becoming... looks very Souls like, which I know you're hoping it's not. Yeah, because I'm kind of tired of Souls games. Like they're they're cool, but they're very difficult to play, which is kind of a bar entry on some stuff, but and can be rewarding. But everybody's cloning Souls type gameplay, which honestly is boring. Um, so August twentieth is when that comes out. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tales of Kenzara Zhao is coming is April uh, 23rd, 23rd 2024 uh, then we have Pele is coming to Nintendo Switch next week so that's coming out this coming week mm-hmm. so December 14th uh, Outlast Trials is coming to consoles so Outlast is a horror game so this is a multiplayer version of that so it'll probably be like asymmetrical like Dead by Daylight type game yeah Rise of the Golden Idol. It's uh, also premiered. Yep. Don't know much about that. <laughs> uh, Dust, as Dust Falls, we played that game. That's coming to PlayStation 4 and 5. Yeah. The Last Sentinel was revealed with that game. That was a CG uh, thing. So it looked like a cyberpunk uh, world. Like almost a... Uh, what is that? AI? Uh, it reminds me of... Um, God. Wait... The other, the other cyberpunk movie that everybody, talk, everybody talks about. The one that was okay. like 2049 was the most recent one. Oh, uh, Blade Runner. Yeah. It looks like a Blade Runner type universe. Because they were hunting down robots. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, that was A24? That was Last Sentinel. No, I'm talking about the movie. You said A24 no, is this movie. No, uh, the last movie was 2049. Oh, 2049. Blade Runner 2049. Oh, okay. Come on, um, what? <laughs> so Zenless Zone Zero, that is another like Honkai game from the whole universe. Mm-hmm. Warhammer finally got a release date, the Space Marine one for September 9th, twenty twenty four. Um Mech Break is a has a combat trailer. I don't know what that is. Yeah. The first descendant uh was another movie, another trailer that we don't know anything about. Just like a look like a space world type of sci fi ga- game. Yeah. It's coming out in the summer 2024. Uh, Exoborn is an extraction shooter, so that 
if you like extraction shooters, maybe that's good for you, but um, not a lot of people are into that. Guilty Gear is not a game I care about. Banishers look really cool. Mm, um, yes. We don't know when it's coming out, though. It just got another trailer. Yep. That's the one with, like, the colonial uh, Scotsman with his wife who's dead, who's a dead ghost, and they're, they're combating the supernatural. Yeah. That one looks good. Uh, First Berserker is just a flashy action game. It has nothing to do with Berserk or anything like that. Which you want. Oh, I would love another Berserk game. They had one on, on Sega Dreamcast that was really good. Um, what? Supernatural Action Adventure. So, Unusual June. Unusual June. Yeah. Which looks like another indie game. So, these are like really small indie games that I... Yeah, a bunch of indie games were also announced. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think yeah, that's basically basically it. Yeah. Um, oh, they also gave a uh, Suicide Squad: Kill Justice League which, a release date, uh, which still looks like meh. It's yeah. Coming out in February. It looks like another uh, live service game that nobody wants to play. Yep. So yeah, and then Hawkeye Star Rail got another trailer, but it's not coming to anything else right now. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Yep. A, lot of, a, lot of kind of, a lot of interesting games coming out next year, but it's more so we got to wait to see more of them because they announced some stuff, but it wasn't like really like, hey, here's gameplay. And that's how that always goes. It's like you're never like, well, this doesn't look like, I don't know what this game is. So yeah. I don't know what to be excited. Like Matthew McConaughey came out and said, yeah, I'm, I'm part of this game. But like the trailer okay. never showcased it, never revealed his character or him voicing anything. Which is what was very smart about CD Projekt Red. Right? And they're like, here's Cyberpunk 27. 2077. Yeah. Here's fucking Keanu Reeves. Look, here he is in the trailer. So you're like, oh, yeah, so it's, you better just run into him and not realize, no, he's part of it. Yeah, so it's weird to have Matthew McConaughey show up and uh, present a game but not show any content with of, him, with in, him it. in it. But there's no character with his likeness. There's no character that he's voicing that we could tell in that trailer. So yeah. Again, it's another sci-fi universe game. That's all I can say about it because it takes place in space or whatnot. I have no idea what type of gameplay it is. Yeah, they don't reveal yeah. much of the story. Yeah, so that's kind of the downside of all these trailers. Like, cool, you're not so much shit, but I don't know what any of this is or what the gameplay is like, so why would I, why would yeah, I care? Yeah, so I can't get excited unless it's a known IP. Yeah, because I don't know what this is, and I don't know how I'm going to play it. Is it a third-person action match? Is it a first-person? If you don't let us let players know what those what the gameplay is going to somewhat be like, then there's no point for us getting excited over a CG trailer because then it's like, well, it's a movie trailer at that point. Yeah. And I just got to, it's passive entertainment. People play games for interactive entertainment. So we want to know how we're going to interact with that world, not just see a setup story of time travel and time dilation or something like that. We need to see the actual, what's the gameplay going to be like? Yeah. To know if it's going to be something fun and worthwhile to play. Because um, for all we know, some of this could just be narrative games that have no gameplay and it's just scrolling through text the entire time to, to experience a story. Uh, that's literally, it could be a first-person shooter to a narrative game. We Nobody knows what it is. And that's why I don't really care for trailers like those things. And it's like, yeah, I don't know what this is, so who cares? Yeah. Um, but basically, that's the Game Awards. That's our show this week. Uh, we will be back next week with more stuff. There's some new things coming out uh, next week, like... Uh, Yu Yu Hakushu, I think premieres next Friday, so we'll probably talk about uh, that. Thursday, it Thursday, premieres. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and a few other things. Uh, you can always find us at www.nerdcrusade.com. Uh, we'll have some Twitch streams up this week. Uh, since we don't have anything planned on Thursday or Friday, I'll be able to actually just sit down and stream for the day. Uh, so we'll be streaming this Thursday and Friday um, and playing a very variety of different games, probably maybe some Boulder Gates 3, so you can see me make bad decisions in that. Yay! Um, and then we'll go to, uh, we'll talk about whatever else we come up with, maybe watch some more Christmas movies or whatnot. Yes. So we will see you then, uh, catch you later. Bye!